Sitting with her arms folded, she confessed that she had to pay them back for all the suffering they had caused her. Recalling all the events that were a real suffering for her, she promised that she would never forgive them and that her revenge would be sweet only for her. She promised that they would live their last days in despair and torment while she took out her anger on them. She promised that she would manipulate them for her own purposes, as if it were a regular game of chess, and then she threw them away, as they had done to her. For her, they were like old, useless chess pieces, so she had to get rid of them so that nothing would be left. The interlocutor, who was in the room with her all this time, and listened attentively to all her words about her great desire for revenge, noted that judging by all these words, it seems that revenge is the meaning of her life. In fact, she couldn't help but agree because it was partly true, but she couldn't leave the situation unresolved. Thinking back to all those events when she was a prisoner under the control of these same people, if you could call them that, she spent almost all her time looking at the wall and wishing she could leave this place. It was constantly damaged, even if it was only one area, it was the focus of all the attention of these people. Looking at all her injuries, she hoped that eventually Nell would come to this prison and rescue her. She just had to endure for a little while longer. She looked back at the door, which opened with a corresponding sound, and hoped to see Nell in front of her. But Valentine could only recognize a face full of suffering. Valentine was Neris's sister who did not even try to help her, but only helped her relatives inflict even more suffering on the girl's terribly tired body. Looking at the dress Valentine was wearing, Neris couldn't help but notice that it was uncannily similar to the dress she had been planning to wear to the gala for a long time. The white-haired girl immediately noticed that Neris's face changed even more when she noticed her dress. She spun it around in front of her as if to show it off, commenting that it suited her much better than her sister's. In addition to the clothes, she also had the opportunity to take her sister's place next to the crown prince, whom she had been planning to marry for as long as she had been choosing her dress. All of this suited her much better. Looking at all of Valentine's actions, she realized that she had not come to support her at all, but only to worsen her condition with her bullying and desire to trample on the dirt even more. The bullying instantly stopped as soon as Valentina remembered the real reason for her visit. In fact, the white-haired girl was ecstatic to see with her own eyes the true end of her dear and beloved sister. Even if the girl was of lower origin, her belonging to a noble family was linked to the corresponding eye color she had the opportunity to inherit. It was easy to take advantage of, but that benefit was not supposed to last long enough for her to live to old age, so it was the most logical end for her to live like this. I knew this from the very beginning, so it took me a while to realize that Valentine had been thinking this way for days and had been dreaming about this day for quite some time. She could not believe that all her family had betrayed her because they had wanted her dead all her life. Valentine was not going to hear it, so she began to give orders to the knight standing next to her. She didn't understand her sister's anger and sudden decision, since she had been helping her all along and doing everything she told her to do. Looking at her clumsy sister, Valentine was tired of wasting time waiting and ordered the knight standing at the door of the prison to seize Neris. Starting to scream with the last of her strength, she tried to break free from the man's tight grip, begging her sister to change her mind. Continuing to escape from the strong grip of one of the knights, Neris continued to claim that she still belonged to a noble family and was the sister of the lord to whom the knight served. Finally, he could not take all these balochki and attempts to escape from his hands for so long, so he put her on the cold floor of the prison, stopping all her attempts to escape. Still in the state of shock she had been in for the last while under her family's rule, Neris only wanted to know if Nell and Nelishin were aware of the situation. Continuing to tease her with her ostentatious tone and the terribly warm smile on her face that completely denied the whole situation, her sister ignored the question, leaving Neris in a state of hysterical thought. Lifting the skirt of her dress, Valentine allowed herself to comment that her sister, although she had gone through similar torment, was still as stupid as she was. One of the legs protruding from the skirt stepped on the girl's injured leg, causing even more pain. She could not believe that Neris still considered herself the master's sister and wanted his servants to believe this lie as well, so her actions were to be some kind of punishment and a share of the abuse she loved so much. 
Valentine still, she had a bit of humanity in her soul, so she decided to tell her sister something interesting that she would definitely want to hear. She told me that the Nell she was so worried about was the man who killed her mother and planned it all. Neris kept at least a fraction of her hope alive that Nell was not like that, and that he did not have such a desire to hurt her. Without giving Anya a second to think, Valentine continued to fill her head with new information. She said that it was with her help that her family eventually became independent of the Empire. It was because of this that she could give Neris the opportunity to pass away painlessly, with just a small vial of potion. Continuing to resist, she could not accept the fact that she was about to die at the hands of her sister, so even as the vial gradually reached her mouth, she continued to try to calm down. It was a kind of gift for the fact that Neris was faithful to the Valentin family until the end of her days. So to hear the truth and to experience a painless death was a great gift and a sign of great kindness. When the magic solution was inside her body, she still couldn't come to terms with the fact that everyone had betrayed her. With a smile on her face, Valentine's mother continued to tell her daughter about her plan for a painless death of her daughter. The woman also noted that everything had to be done quickly and carefully, because even the already soulless body of the lucky woman could be very useful in inheriting the magical eye color. As Valentine poured the last drops of the potion into Neris's still living body, she noted that none of Neris's efforts had been in vain, nor had the drops of the magic potion. Nerissa's eyes seemed mischievous, as if they were developing shards of pink glass faster and faster. Commenting on her sister's efforts, Valentine also said that she had played an excellent piece in their chess game. Hearing these words, it was as if a second breath of air had appeared in Neris's soul. She remembered that for the sake of her family and the Empire, she had gone above and beyond and done everything, and now she was being told to just give it all up. Before she found herself on the cold floor, unable to breathe, she was still thinking about what she had done wrong. She was not guilty because of her lowly origins, which she could not change. She was not guilty because of the color of her eyes, which she also inherited against her will. It was all horrible and unfair. All of them took her life for something she could not choose. When her soul separated from her body, and she fell on the cold stone that was under her feet and filled the entire prison, she spoke words in her head, cursing all the perpetrators. Already on his motionless, pale face, crystal tears began to appear, flowing in large quantities from his broken eyes. The red, viscous liquid dripped into the middle of the broken clock, where it turned into crystal-clear water at the junction of the two halves. A transparent liquid gradually poured out of the base of this broken clock, turning into a transparent, bright gem whose light could blind anyone. Suddenly, those same big, bright eyes could see again. It was like the end, but also like the beginning of something new. A clear liquid continued to pour out of those big, childish eyes. Very quickly, the little Neris was able to regain consciousness and feel alive again, hearing her mother calling out to her. Looking at her daughter's crying face, the woman could not understand the reason for the incessant tears. Wiping them with her hand, she looked into the eyes of the little frightened girl. Her face was full of questions, and she was trying to find a connection between them. Neris quickly recognized her mother in the face of the white-haired woman. She could hear her tenderness in her touch and words, which she had only been able to recall for many years. The small house in which Neris and her mother grew up was always very quiet, except for the occasional voice of her mother calling out to her daughter. As she loudly opened the door to her daughter's room, the woman said that she had better be ready to go to the academy, otherwise she might be late. Looking into the back of her room, she saw her daughter standing in front of the mirror, with the wind from the open window blowing her hair and skirt. Reacting quickly, Neris looked back at her mother with a smile on her face that was full of joy. The woman's reaction was a bit confused, which embarrassed her daughter a bit. She asked her mother if something had happened to her, because looking at her expression, one could assume that she was worried about something. The woman replied that everything was normal, and that for a second, she thought that her little Neris had become an adult. It was as if the woman was already missing her daughter, based on the fact that she was to leave the house today. Without letting her mother finish, the little girl threw her arms around her, 
leaving her mother no choice but to bid her a warm farewell. The girl herself thought that she had been acting strangely lately, but this could be explained by the fact that she was very nervous about being sent to the academy. She was still nervous, but now she was sure she was on the right track and had to make sure everything would be okay. She recalled how, when she was very young, they used to take walks in the woods with her mother while she picked berries from the full glade. Now she could say that she was fully grown, so she had to take responsibility for her life on her own. Her mother could only accept that her little bird was leaving the nest and going on her own. Already knowing exactly how this trip to the academy would end, the little girl, who was lucky enough to get a second chance from fate, knew that this time she would do everything she could. Exactly 120 years ago, after receiving the support of Princess Catherine, the nobility asked the mind of the empire to look into his soul for kindness and share his deep knowledge with them. The place where they all gathered was eventually called Cotton, and the academy located in its center was named Nobel. For nobles who happened to be born in a lower category, like the Neris, their education at this academy depended on their economic status. But for the children of the upper nobility, such as members of the royal family, there were always vacancies. They were obliged to study from the age of 12 to 19. All the lower-class nobles dreamed of getting here, but the children of the upper-class nobles knew that this academy was tantamount to a prison, because that's what they meant by the words compulsory education. Suddenly, the fascination with the sculpture, which was located right at the entrance to Caton, was interrupted by a voice calling out to a little girl. Looking back at her interlocutor, who was being completely impolite to the stranger, the same woman actually ordered Neris to show her the way, as she thought the girl lived nearby. Neris may have been a pie girl at first glance, but she also had character, which she now had to demonstrate in order not to be at a disadvantage. She called herself the daughter of a knight, and said that the woman, who was apparently a member of the lower nobility, was behaving very rudely. After apologizing, Neris told the woman that although she had been rather rude to her, she would go unpunished this time. In exchange, the maid would have to leave the girl's company immediately. As the woman bowed before the Neris, she didn't even notice a luxurious carriage appear behind her, and a loud laugh came from it, which caught the girl's attention. One of the children of the upper nobility looked out and apologized for her maid, as she did sometimes behave rudely to strangers. This green-eyed girl clarified that her maid had no bad intentions, but only wanted to ask for directions. The green-eyed girl quickly left the carriage with the help of the butler and asked Neris if she was one of the Alanders. Neris did not understand why the assumption was made because of her former residence, but she clarified that judging by the shade of her eyes, she did not think that Neris was the daughter of a common knight. Among the three warriors who were able to defeat the fierce dragon in a grandiose manner, only one is famous for being a symbol of Alandria and having the eyes of a Buddha. Each of the descendants of the three warriors was born with different character traits, and these differences were usually manifested in their eyes. Thus, the first emperor, the brave Visto, had dark blue eyes, the righteous Alandria had purple eyes, and the charming Palos had gray eyes. However, their direct descendants were considered lost, and the entire family was cut off. At a time when even Elandria's eyes had gone out, Neris, a distant relative from a sideline, was born with purple eyes. After she had to celebrate her coming of age, she was able to see with her own eyes the precious ability of her special trait and was elevated to the place of the princess's crown. As she got closer to the Neris, the stranger reported that the Buddha's eyes were an exception, so she did not see them as often as she would have liked. With a face full of enthusiasm, the girls seemed to be looking into the eyes of the Neris, claiming that their eyes were the most beautiful she had ever seen in her short life. Clenching her fingers together, forming a fist out of her hand, Neris declared that she was in no way connected to Elandria. In her past life, she actively used her status which was associated with her eyes, but now, remembering their color, she felt only disgust. So when the stranger said she came from the Trid family, she said she was disgusted. Deciding not to escalate the situation any further, the green-eyed woman accepted her interlocutor's words, saying that other families also had the opportunity to inherit the Buddha's eyes. 
Neris's words were so serious and her speech seemed so confident that the girl assumed that her interlocutor was already a sophomore, but now she was happy because they were both classmates. She introduced herself as Diane McKinnon. If the green-eyed girl did come from the McKinnon family, she was the daughter of Earl McKinnon, who owned one of the three largest chambers of commerce in the empire. It was a little strange, because Neris did not remember meeting Diane in her past life. Eventually, the butler had to inform the little miss that she shouldn't have stood on her feet for so long because it could have had a negative impact on them, but she claimed to be quite confident on them, so he shouldn't have worried. Naturally, Neris could not ignore this dialogue that was taking place in front of her face, so she involuntarily lowered her gaze. Her eyes quickly noticed how unsteady Diane was on her feet. Even if you didn't focus on it, you could see one of her legs shaking visibly. After calling out to Neris, Diane had to follow her butler's words and go to the carriage, but her interlocutor replied in a rather serious tone that the girl should not be too nice to her. Still, it was not a directed kindness, as they really did not know the way to the academy, and the Neris suitcases looked quite large for such a small girl. Eventually agreeing to this small offer, as it was a win-win situation for both of them, they quickly arrived at the academy, whose exterior looked charming and luxurious. As they walked inside, they were greeted by an equally luxurious interior in the hall. Diane had to thank Neris for being so kind and not leaving them in the lurch. Already sitting on the chairs, Diane sincerely thanked her new friend for helping them get here and for helping Diane personally get inside, but Neris replied that she only held her lightly. Diane told us that her legs were fine and that the adults were just exaggerating and saying that it would be harder and harder for her at the academy. Judging by the fact that Neris did not remember Diane's face, it followed that the adults were worried for no reason. It all stemmed from the fact that the competition at the academy was quite fierce, and it was not only difficult, but impossible for students with a weak character to adapt to such conditions. Diane's unsteady gait made her the center of attention, and her weakness was easy enough to figure out without even talking to her for a second. Even though only children studied at the academy, they are trained from childhood to recognize the weak and find everyone's weaknesses. Because Neris had already attended the academy, she already knew what the other noblemen's children were doing, their tactics were quite simple. They would gather in groups, make friends, and then create a hierarchy within that group. It wouldn't have made sense if they didn't have a purpose, and since their purpose was to fill time out of boredom, it was the perfect and easy entertainment. Even as an adult, Neris remembered from her past life how her classmates liked to bully her. The punishment for showing her character was that they chained her to a desk in the academy yard in the rain. Standing under their umbrellas, they laughed at her maliciously, wanting her to get even more angry and break out. With her lips clenched until they were blue and large drops of sweat running down her hair and face onto her clothes, Neris could only endure and wait for them to get bored and eventually leave her alone. A bright and large bolt of lightning struck the ground, followed by loud words from one of the girls who ordered the others to escort the Neris inside the academy. Already on the cold floor of the academy, the girl was irritated and tired. She couldn't get up because she had lost all her strength to contain her anger, but her classmates only encouraged her to show her character. Their words about her getting up and not stimulating the unbearable pain of being slightly drenched by the rain were not the last. They also remarked that they had heard rumors that because of the color of her eyes, she might be chosen as a candidate for crown princess. Of course, according to the other girls, she did not deserve this place, and more and more they tried to humiliate her. Noticing how the poor girl was shivering, having been sitting in the rain and strong wind for a long time, they missed with smiles on their faces that she might have been sick and had a fever. Deciding not to end their abuse there, they also dumped a bucket of water on her head, which was standing nearby. Neris looked as if she had already resigned herself to these events, which was understandable, since she had already exhausted all her strength. Before she left, one of them said that poor Neris should think about whether she really deserved to be crown princess. One of the many drops that remained on her head from the rain and water that had recently brought her back to consciousness fell into a puddle left by her soaked clothes. She claimed that she knew nothing about the place of the blood princess that she was supposed to take, 
These words really irritated one of the people present, and she came closer to the trembling girl, almost stepping on her palms, which she held on the floor, leaning on them. She stated that Neris was so stupid and disinterested in what was happening that she did not even know why she was enduring these humiliations literally every day. She was supposed to remain forever that short-sighted idiot who doesn't even want to change so as not to take the place of others. Let her live in ignorance for the rest of her life and then die like a clueless idiot. Her memories were interrupted by an unfamiliar voice that came from the stage, catching her attention. With his oratory and persuasiveness, this voice attracted the attention of many students. The narrative content of this voice was the story of three heroes who defeated the evil dragon Kion. It was thanks to this that the Vista Empire was able to become strong through the spirit of improvement. Suddenly, Neris turned her attention to a similarly glowing hair that had belonged to one of her abusers in her past life. She looked intently only at the owner. The voice from the stage did not stop, and he also said that he hoped that all the new students of this year, as citizens of the glorious Vista Empire, would not stay in the present and would learn the philosophy of the Nobel Academy. Perseverance and the desire to improve in the hearts of young students is actually a guarantee of success. They should not lose it, but only develop it further. With that, the silver-haired man concluded the induction ceremony, saying that the new students could already get acquainted with the dormitory thanks to the wardens who were already waiting for them in the hall. Standing up from her chair, Diane turned toward Nerissa to call out to her to come along. These small walks, and Diane's help, would be the beginning of a great friendship. Seeing that her friend looked terrible and was not feeling well, Diane's face instantly changed to one of concern and wanted to know why. It took only one look at one of her abusers for the memories to come flooding back to her, leaving her mind racing. She understood that such actions and the desire to get rid of this unpleasant feeling in her body would not help her, and she also had no intention of showing her weaknesses, so the only thing left was to calm down. Diane noticed that the girl looked rather pale, but she replied that she was just nervous and that they should go if they didn't want to be late. Suddenly, their attention was drawn to the conversations up ahead. They could hear that the first day of school had begun with fresh gossip, the topic of which was that Crown Prince Abelis and the Marquis's daughter Lycaandra were having a nice conversation. They wondered if little Lycaandra really had any intentions of taking the princess's place on the throne, but they also kept in mind that the Crown Prince had already met a lady whose name was spread in high society. It was unexpected to see such a pair even in a simple conversation, as it was most likely the first girl to approach the Crown Prince, and an unusual girl, Megara Lycaandra herself. Wandering around the garden near the academy, Neris decided to clear her head, as she was surprised by her own behavior. She couldn't even think that she could have been so nervous just because of a simple meeting with Megara. Her walk, filled with silence and enjoyment of the beautiful scenery, was interrupted by a voice that wanted to know who this unknown girl was. He said that he hadn't thought at all that someone should have been present at the academy, because it was still vacation time. But the unknown person did not care that much because his main concern was that someone from the unknown had entered the territory. Neris remembered this shortcut, which she had used extensively in her past life, but she did not remember anyone stopping and asking her questions. Although she was new, she was not lost at all. She knew that she was now in the Pesalza, which was a forbidden place to bring in all kinds of objects. His voice began to tremble a little, but he found the strength to simply chase the girl away from the place, saying that she knew a lot for her age. To this, the girl remarked that the boy needed to be equally careful, because if he kept dirty things in his ear, he would quickly die from drug intoxication, addressing him by the name Ren Fayel. Confusion and interest appeared on Fayel's surprised face when he heard his own name from the lips of the girl who was new to him, according to her. It was impossible for the younger brother of the former Pope Tacitus VI to have gotten himself a similar item, so it meant that this item had been passed down to him from other hands. His expression was so filled with surprise that some of his muscles relaxed, and he involuntarily let the leaf fall from his mouth. In her past life, Neris took advantage of the fact that she had magical eyes, 
but in this life she decided to use the position of all the facts and acquaintances she knew from her past life, so she had to know that Fail had died alone from intoxication. In the past, she hadn't paid attention to such things and didn't dwell on them, but now, thinking about it, she could find logic in absolutely everything. The current Pope Omnitus III considered Wren, the younger brother of former Pope Pius II, superfluous to their cause. So by invading the trust of the Wren Fail, whose soul was completely lost after the loss of his entire family, he made the poor boy rely on him. After the Fael completely trusted Pope Omnitus III, the man began to feed him a poisonous herb that had a strong sedative effect, but thereby led to a slow and horrible death. Addressing the boy on the other side of the fence, Neris said that he should not be gullible to anyone and choose his close people very carefully. Answering that faith was the most important thing for a priest, he attracted the attention of the girl, who looked back at him and said that her words were not empty and that he should have listened to her. Fael wondered what his interlocutor knew that she was trying so hard to protect him, but he still had no idea how a simple letter could destroy him, so he was about to put it back in his mouth. Gathering all her strength, she said that if she were in the boy's shoes, she would definitely find a way to take revenge on the person who had harmed her and do it properly. As she turned around and prepared to walk in the opposite direction from where she was talking to the Fayel, she spoke about how she would have been very sorry if he had died from the poisonous herb at such a young age, so he should have quit. Finding some meaning in the girl's words, he finally examined the letter carefully, wondering if it was really worth it. There is no escaping bullying and hierarchy in the world, even if you are an adult, not to mention children who can be very cruel. Everybody had the same fate if they were to be born weak, so age had no bearing on it at all. The Nobel Academy was no exception, as similar things happened there quite often, if not every day. Looking at the building, which was familiar to the girl not for the first time in her life, she pondered her fate to be in this particular period of her life. Not wanting to look at these magnificent walls outside such a horrible building anymore, she turned around, finally realizing the meaning of her stay. She could not forgive all the abuse from Valentine and her family, nor could she forgive the abuse from her classmates. It was within the academy that the turning point of her misfortune occurred, and from that moment on, she had to take revenge on everyone. Everyone knew that the Nobel Academy was divided into two branches, which taught classes in different disciplines. These included the Kartak, which was a male branch that taught fencing, magic, politics, and theology. In addition to the men's branch, there was a women's branch called Aina, where they taught regular lessons and the same theology. On their first day at Nobel Academy, all new students have to take a test, and depending on the results of this test, these children will be divided into the appropriate classes. To put it another way, if a certain child had grades that exceeded the level of knowledge of the corresponding grade, he or she could skip it. On the day when the results of these tests were known, Students gathered around the board with their names on it and looked for theirs, hoping that they would be able to separate themselves from the others. All the students were surprised when they saw Neris Trid first on the board, because they could not even miss who the new girl was. Neris herself was already set up for this, because she knew perfectly well that her mind was much more separate from the minds of the other children, because she was the same age as them. She was surprised by a call from Diane, who had really hoped that they would attend classes together. But seeing as she had passed the test, she was able to skip one course and move on to the second. To this, Neeraz replied that they would still have joint classes, as the main subjects are common to all students, which brought a smile to Diane's face. Neeraz's words were surprising to the green-eyed girl, as she could not even imagine that her friend could have known about such things. Calling her friend brilliant, Diane did not even know what this silent girl was really capable of. She also said that among all the people she met and knew, she was the most elegant and intelligent, even without relying on the fact that she took first place in the overall competition. If she had been in her interlocutor's shoes, the entire academy would have known about this long ago. But looking at the Neris's serious endurance, she could not help but envy her. Because Diane was quite annoying, she began to beg Neris to tell her her nickname, and Neris decided that it would be best if her friend called her Reese, like her mother. Thinking that if the Megara decides to destroy the beginning of her life again, 
Then, in exchange, the Nelitian will be able to repay her in kind. According to the course of events, the Neris life will unfold. She didn't want to hear the name he called her anymore, which was so painful to hear because it sounded like his. The unexpected conversation between the girls and Neris's thoughts were interrupted by a very quiet cough, which wanted to draw attention to itself and did what it wanted to do. A small, big-eyed girl appeared in front of her and Diane, introducing herself as Angara Nain, saying that Neris should know her because they had played together as children. Her gaze, which had been completely calm and gentle, instantly turned vicious. Her eyes turned bright pink, looking at Angara as if burning a hole in her. Holding her angry eyes as if she saw an enemy in front of her, Neris averted her own gaze, saying that she was not even a name in her life. Determined to continue, to try to recall her existence in Neris's early childhood, Angara said that they walked together in the Lowen Forest and played with boats they made from tree leaves. These words passed like an imperceptible magical current through Neris's body, because everything that happened that day is firmly in her memory to this day. It was impossible not to remember the hangar, because it was impossible to forget the one who was her only friend. However, the same friend acted very incorrectly towards Neris when she mistreated her in order to get closer to the Megara. With a completely calm expression on her face, Neris replied that she would later ask her mother about the hangar, who might remember her. These words caused the Angara to pause, as if she had something else to say. Her face looked worried, and her hands were fidgeting. The blue-eyed girl didn't give up so easily. She wanted to try to get closer to Nihilus, at least a little, by asking her which teacher she had taken lessons from. If they were from the same feudal lordship, then perhaps the Angara also knew the teacher who taught the Neris and could try to reach her level. With a completely calm face, Neris replied that it was fate that decided this case, and that she was just lucky to be born with such a mind. She hoped that this answer would be enough for her interlocutor, because she did not want to repeat the same mistakes she had made in her past life and live this life differently. She will no longer trust her childhood friend, only to be cruelly abandoned again. Another student of the academy also joined their dialogue, saying that she had accidentally overheard the conversation and did not want to stay in the party. She said that the name of the teacher who taught Neris should not have been so secret and she should not have been so selfish. It must be that she decided to put herself above the others only because she took first place in the poll. In her opinion, this first place was not taken by chance, and her loud tone meant that others could hear this conversation as well. Deciding to stand up for herself, Neris said that her father had died when she was very young, so her family did not have the money to have a teacher, which meant that the girls' interrogations were completely illogical. Even now, she accepts help from distant relatives who are able to pay for her education at this academy. Of course, the Count's granddaughter, named Rhiannon Bertha, could not even imagine such a situation, because she could never even miss the fact that not as rich as she was can be born smart. Rhiannon took these words as a challenge, and her tone of voice rose significantly as she tried to find out the truth about Neris's high score, because she did not believe in ordinary luck. Neris was not going to prove her innocence and honesty. She only said that she had learned the sacred language from a priest. In response to this, Rhiannon asked her interlocutor if this training included learning manners. Since Neris had previously reported that she had no teacher, it would make sense that she was not at all aware of manners in Rhiannon's opinion. In response, Neris didn't even know if she could call it a relief to her soul, since her interlocutor was not at all distinguishable from Rhiannon from her past life. Judging by the old Rhiannon's character, one could say that she always mocked the Neris, being in a state of full confidence that everyone would take her side. Then Neris continued her words, that even though she was the daughter of a knight of low birth, she should not have tolerated such treatment, and given the curriculum of Rhiannon County, she was simply jealous of her grade. However, looking at her behavior, which went beyond the norm, Neris wondered if Rhiannon had really been trained in the etiquette for which she was criticizing her. Rihanna's face showed anger at not being able to achieve what she wanted. She realized that she had taken a completely unfavorable position in this conversation and would no longer receive everyone's support. Diane also stood up in support of Nellis, accusing Rhiannon of wanting to start a fight by sarcastically answering questions. The crowd that had gathered around Neris was watching this quarrel. 
Everyone watched with emotion as Diane tried to stand up for her friend, relying on the inferiority complex that lurked within Rhiannon. In the end, the whole circle began to support Neris, arguing that Rhiannon had really gone too far and that even if she was that jealous, it was too much. In the end, their quarrel was stopped by Megara, who told them that the lesson was about to start and that the noise the girls had made was not worth the price. Looking at Megara, who was coming closer and closer to them, Rhiannon couldn't understand why she hadn't come to her defense as well. Megara apologized to Neris for her friend's behavior, as her jealousy had gone beyond the pale. But at the same time, she noted that the first place that Neris took was also surprising, eventually accepting that she really did it on her own. These two girls met for the first time, so Megara introduced herself and asked that their team not have such quarrels, because she wanted to live in peace and harmony, regardless of who took first place and who took second. Even if her words were not meant to be ridiculing or teasing, it was clear from her expression that she was still the megalomaniac she knew. Finally, putting a kind smile back on her face, Megara congratulated Neris on her first place. It was as if the child who was sponsored by Elandria had differences from others. These differences were evident in her rapid learning. A teacher walked into the classroom and did not understand why the students were not in their seats. He couldn't understand what they were doing instead of preparing for class. Taking his seat and asking the students to take their seats, he emphasized that he was going to hand out test results and their schedules. Megara had already obeyed the man and began to approach her seat, but suddenly Neris called out to her to stay in her seat. She asked me to accept her congratulations in return as well, which I found was to be the beginning of their long friendship. Noting that she wanted Megara to take care of her, her face instantly stopped being as calm and emotionless as usual. She smiled at her as her eyes lit up with bright color. At the very beginning of the semester, all students at the academy were to be divided into two subcategories, namely strong and weak. When handing in the test results, the teacher pointed out to each student what their strengths were so that they could develop in this area. It was interesting to see what the criteria for this distribution were, since in the end, Neris was among the weakest. It was because of this simple accident that she had to endure such an attitude towards herself throughout her studies, and she could do nothing against it. As she waited for the teacher to approach the Megara, she was completely focused on what role she would play in this period of her life. Noting that Megara had turned in an almost perfect paper that took second place, the man said that in some subjects she could have skipped a course, so she should definitely look at her schedule before going to class. Megara's eyes were full of enthusiasm and gratitude towards Professor Sheridan, as if she had not expected to receive such pleasant words in her address. As she walked to her seat, whispers could be heard throughout the room with her as the topic of conversation. Some of the students remarked that everyone in Lika Andra's family was different and that Megara was amazing. Professor Sheridan was the next to call Neris Trid, who immediately got up from her chair and was about to head in his direction. Passing by the Megars, a strange atmosphere hung between them for a moment until the Neris moved on. Looking back at Neris, who had just passed her, Megara gave her an iron gaze. It was fun for the girl to watch Megara's childhood, as she always pretended to be kind and good, looking at everyone with a smile on her face. Right now, Neris could see the disgruntled face full of envy of her actual rival, who was definitely not happy to be in second place. Professor Sheridan was very complimentary of Neris because she answered all the questions correctly. She had jumped all the courses except for the basic ones that everyone has to take, so it would have been good for her to check her schedule as well. Looking back as she was about to leave the teacher, Neris was really curious why all these years had been so difficult for her from the past. She was curious to know the reason why she tolerated them while hiding in the shadows from Megara's evil gaze. In addition to being bullied at school, Nalishan was also waiting for her at home, forcing Neris to join his family and using her to further his own ambitions. Nalisha's younger sister, Valentine, must have hated Neris with all her heart, because she had suddenly appeared out of nowhere and become the crown princess. And for Prince Abel himself, she was probably not the most pleasant object in his life either, since it was he who was to marry her. It was all connected, because everyone had a reason, except for one horrifying person who led Neris into hell itself. All of the girls at the academy, especially Megara, had no reason to bully her. 
but they did it anyway. Perhaps she should have accepted it, because nothing would have changed if she had known the real reason. There was some laughter from Rhiannon's seat, which was too quiet to be noticed by the professor, but it was easily noticed by Neris, who was passing by her seat. Behind it, she also heard a mockery from her about the girl acting too arrogantly, not knowing her place. This became an impetus for the already adult mind of Nerissa to understand all the reasons for such a rude agreement with her. It was because all the girls at the academy had an inferiority complex and were jealous that the daughter of a low-level knight usually had high grades and a non-standard appearance. Perhaps they were still superficial, but in their entire lives they had never seen such pure emotions like theirs. When their first lesson was over, everyone usually scattered to different corners of the corridor, talking loudly among themselves, with only Angara Nain standing alone far away from the others. Diane McKinnon noticed this too, and decided to ask her friend if they really did not know each other. She didn't have time to think about it, but she did, so she said she didn't remember her at all. After receiving a similar answer to the previous one, Diane decided to believe it and not to bother her interlocutor anymore. In response, she said that Diane should have gone back to her studies, as she had another class soon. She hadn't been there herself for a while, so she wanted to spend some time getting to know the academy better. Looking into the eyes of the Nerys, Diane also noted that she would not mind keeping the Nerys company, but it would be very rude to skip her classes. Nerys replied that they would have plenty of time in the future, so they would have time to walk together again someday. This answer completely satisfied Diane, and she was about to leave Nerys because she had to go to school to get her degree. She hadn't had time to forget the kind gesture of her rescuer, who had recently supported Nerys. She decided not to waste time and thank her right now, so as not to remain in debt. Unexpectedly, those warm words from the lips of her unassuming acquaintance seemed gentle and frank, which even lifted her spirits a bit. Eventually, they had to say goodbye before the green-eyed girl was late for her classes, so she smiled at her friend one last time and left her company. After saying goodbye to Diane, Neris was already coming up with a plan for where she should go now, because she knew the academy very well. Eventually, she decided to go to her secret place, which she remembered from her previous life. It was near Zachary's library and was supposed to be quite quiet. It was named in honor of St. Zacharias, who in the distant past made a great contribution to modern medicine. However, because the nobility avoided classes, the library was always empty, which is why this place was particularly deserted, which was very pleasing to Nevis's lonely soul. The silence could have given her at least some time to think, during which she had to consider how to proceed. It should have been a magical plan, but it could not have come to fruition because of the guard who met Neris right at the entrance. His greeting could not be called friendly and warm, because as soon as the girl stepped onto the threshold of the library, the sharp blade of the guard's sword appeared in front of her face. Of course, this shocked her, because in her previous life, no one was interested in the place at all, so she could not even expect danger here. Remaining completely unemotional and unspoken, Neris did not want to answer the guard's questions about who she was. Cledwin of Mainland was the successor to the only Archduke family in the country. After his own graduation from the academy, he repressed all the elders of his family who opposed his inheritance of the title, and then received the northern part of the empire under his rule. However, Abelus and other nobles could not accept his arrival and ridiculed him, calling him a cruel monster. In his past life, they hadn't even crossed paths, so no one could have imagined that Nellis would run into him at the library door. When the blade almost reached her neck, she did not change her expression from calm. She wondered where exactly he had been taught such manners, to poke a sword down a stranger's throat at every single person he met. He was not in the mood for jokes or measuring his anger, so he ordered the girl to tell him who she was and how she knew about this place. Eventually resigned to the fact that she would not be able to get around Cledwin, she told him that she was just a normal first year, but the boy refused to believe that freshmen could know about such places, continuing to hold the sword in his hands. His gaze was focused. He looked at the girl as closely as he could, trying to recognize her as an enemy, but instead he saw only bright eyes that looked directly into his soul, and he immediately realized that she was the possessor of the Buddha's eyes. 
Realizing that Cledwin was not a threat, she confidently touched his sharp sword with her fingertip, which was most likely meant to frighten her. She confirmed his words, but commented that she did not want to be classified as a non-lesionist or associated with him in any way. Such actions of a difficult girl brought a small smile to Cledwin's face. He couldn't understand what kind of girl she was, since she touched the sword so fearlessly with her bare hands. As he put away his sword, he wanted to learn more about the girl and her affiliation with the Nelissian family. He wondered how it was that she did not want to be associated with him. She asked the guy to stop talking about it, because it was not a topic she wanted to bring up by addressing him by name. Cledwin thought it was unfair that even a first-year student knew his name, but had not yet been introduced to him. So he decided not to wait for her to wish him out and take the matter into his own hands. The answer was not what the boy expected, but it once again confirmed the seriousness of the girl's character. Namely, she said that the boy's name was hers, so he would also have to find out her name himself if he wanted to know it. The unexpected response seemed indeed in keeping with the young Nerys's character, but Cledwin himself did not yet know her name or her full acuity of character. Turning in the opposite direction from him, since this conversation was over for Nerys, she had to get back to her business. Before the girl left the room, he called out to her one last time, telling her that next time he would definitely call her by name. It looked like the boy was no less serious. Once back inside the academy building, Nerys had to return to her studies, despite all the other students who were also in the corridor. The bright rays of the warm sun shone through the window glass and into the corridor filled with students. Nerys remembered that Abelis always commented on the whole image of Cledwin as cold-blooded, but he didn't really look like that. When I looked at him, even the emotions of such an emotionless girl as Nerys were confused. In the end, she couldn't exactly believe the Abelis's assessment of Cledwin. After all, the girl had to have her own idea of her social circle without relying on others, so to her, the recent acquaintance looked like a very good person. Suddenly, another of her recent acquaintances, Ren File, appeared behind Nerys, who accidentally bumped into the girl, calling her a lover of sticking her nose in everything. When the guy asked her what she had forgotten on this floor, since she had recently introduced herself as a freshman, she replied that she was not lost at all and knew she was here because she had classes here. This seemed unexpected to Fael because he did not expect to see her again, especially within the academy. Their first meeting went by so quickly that he did not even have time to ask her her name. Nerys wondered why the boy was studying Verlaine, since it was an advanced course among the optional subjects, so only a small part of the students who studied at the Faculty of Theology, to which Fael belonged, took it. After commenting that the freshman's knowledge was too in-depth, the guy nevertheless decided to answer that his maternal uncle lived in Verlaine, so if he came to visit him, it would be nice to speak the language. Recalling her past life, Nerys recalled that Fael's maternal brother was a close associate of Omnitus III, so she had to warn her interlocutor to be careful. As she opened the door to the classroom where she was to have a lecture on the Verlaine language, she considered her next steps in response to Fael's warning of caution. Unexpectedly, she was called into her office by an old acquaintance named Megara, whom she was not at all happy to meet, having already managed to take a place for herself. Megara had a warm smile on her face, as if she was really happy to see her. The words were appropriate. She had not expected to see her, but this surprise was happy. Because she did not know that Nerys would also be present in the class, she had already chosen a seat next to the Marad's brother, so they could not sit together. There were only two reasons why she, a freshman, could take an advanced course in diplomatic Verlaine. The first of which was that she was the only excellent student in all subjects who reported in her test paper that she wanted to take advanced Verlaine. Unlike the excellent student Nerys, Megara got the opportunity to attend these courses with the help of her family's strength, and after she learned that she would be the first to attend, to prove that she was as good as the girl who took first place. She couldn't help but agree to Megara's suggestion that they sit down together the next time they discussed the same subject, as it could definitely arouse suspicion. One of the boys standing next to her asked if he knew the family of her interlocutor, and she replied that they had only found out about Nerys, after she had won first place in the exams. The rumors spread throughout the academy, 
so the boy simply could not help but know that she was the girl who had passed the tests without a single mistake. They were jealous that Neris was able to take first place, so they decided to mock her, saying that if they had won first place, they would have bragged about it everywhere. Fael was quick to notice this. Undaunted, Neris responded by telling the guy that she didn't have as many friends as he did, so her bragging about her own results would be useless. In any case, since it was an advanced elective, she felt awkward attending it as the only freshman. It was good that Megara was able to get into this course anyway, because now Neris will not be so lonely among other students. Clenching her hand into a fist to hold back all the anger she'd built up while talking to Neris, watching her sit down in front of her with Fail, holding his piercing gaze on his neighbor, Fail reflected on how well she was able to respond to rudeness. The elegance of her words literally attacked the Megara, which was surprising. Noticing this, Neris dared to ask him what was going on, but Fail did not even know what to say, so his answer was very brief and incomprehensible. Eventually, the teacher of the Verlaine lecture had to return to the classroom. He was not only a teacher of this subject, but also of international politics, so the students who studied it already knew Henri Walter. The man said that he really hoped that the students had taken the time to read the example text in Waltherian that he had given them long before the first lesson. Now their first task was to try to translate it according to the context and situation. For Neris, this was expected, because she had expected a similar task from Sarah Voltaire. Suddenly, in the back of the classroom, the man saw a raised hand and asked the student what the raised hand meant. This student was Megara Likandra, whom the professor would love to hear from. This could mean an interest in the subject, so the professor had to make an effort not to stop her enthusiasm. Rising from her seat, Megara began to rapidly translate the text on the sheet of paper. She was accompanied by a vigorous reaction from her classmates, who were listening attentively. Listening attentively to Megara's translation, the man heard quiet whispers from the audience that Megara did not take second place, but she was doing quite well. He turned his gaze to the one girl who had actually won first place without making a single mistake in her tests. He asked her if she thought the same way. It was a kind of questioning if she really did not use only her knowledge when taking that test, and it raised doubts not only among the other students, but also among the teachers. Neris replied with a nonchalant expression that Megara had not made any mistakes in her retelling, but that her answer was also incorrect. Neris's remark caused a stir in the classroom among all the students. They claimed that they did not understand her remark at all, because they did not understand where Megara had gone wrong. It seems that the first place in the tests completely destroyed her head, so now she cannot think objectively, praising only herself. The ambiguous answer also made the teacher curious. He asked her what she meant by saying that Megara was not wrong, but she did not give the right answer either. So he wanted to hear the correct answer from Neris Tried. She replied that Livingstone, who was an ambassador sent to Gaul, tried to implement popular policy with improved relations with the inhabitants. However, there were some limits, and because the budget allocated for his trip ran out, he was killed. Megara's neighbor reacted strongly to this, because according to her neighbor, Livingston Kinsey tried to improve the windmills, but due to a lack of budget, he failed and was killed. Thinking about the fact that her answer was completely different from Lycandra's, the man decided to ask young Neris why she had chosen this interpretation of the text. After agreeing to substantiate all of her above words, she rose from her seat to draw even more attention to her arguments. Megara, behind her, also pondered the meaning of her words, since she had not made any mistakes in meaning and therefore did not understand what Neris wanted to get with her loud statements. She explained that the surname Kinsey, which Megara interpreted, is actually pronounced Kanji and is used in Varlina diplomatic contexts to refer to an ambassador. Such words from Megara's actual rival came as a great shock to her, as she herself did not think that Neris could go so deep into dictionaries. With a thoughtful expression on his face, the professor continued to listen to all the explanations, and as for Neris, she mentioned that windmills are also interpreted as a wrong flow in a certain context. It was based on these factors that she translated the content of the example sentence as a story about Ambassador Livingston, 
who was assassinated because of the failure of his policies. In a somewhat displeased tone, the professor remarked that it was more of a free translation than a literal one. Nellis added many of her own conclusions and interpreted it based on her own reflections. She did not deny that she had done so because she had decided that this was what the man meant. Earlier, he had told her to interpret the sentence according to the context and situation, which she had tried to do. In addition, the point of deepening knowledge of the Verlaine language for this class was dedicated to diplomacy, so it was most logical to interpret this sentence to meet these requirements. Also, based on the fact that Voltaire himself was a diplomat, she thought that he would want to hear a similar answer. Without responding to the little girl's statements, the professor asked the entire audience why they thought they should learn foreign languages. To communicate with foreigners, it would be faster to hire an interpreter or use the loon language, which many people know. The answer to his question was voiced by Neris, who said that she existed to win in democracy, and it was the right answer. All the students present in this room were learning a foreign language to improve their diplomatic skills, and they had to keep this thought in mind at all times so as not to ask unnecessary questions about it. They did not have to take all the words literally. The key to their success was that they were able to analyze and think about the meaning, not just consume what was right on the surface. Megara's face turned a delicate shade of pink when she heard these words from the professor's lips, slowly realizing that this class might be her last in this course. She couldn't understand how Neris had gotten around her again. Summing up, the professor said that everyone in the classroom should delve into the meaning of all the words they hear, otherwise they may have problems. Neris, in turn, knew about this, and therefore, unlike her peers, she can take this class now. Everyone in the audience dramatically changed their minds about Neris, because before the professor's words, they had only thought that she was another know-it-all, but in fact she had in-depth knowledge in her head. Megara Lacandra's face grew even more nervous when she heard the professor call out to her. The atmosphere around her was not calm enough as it was, and now her heart was pounding out of her chest. The man said that he only wanted to see students in his class who could keep up with him. When he asked her if they were really enrolled in this course because of Madame Hoffman's recommendation and heard a positive answer, he asked her to stay after class for a while. During this, they would conduct a small test on the Verlaine language. She shouldn't have worried, as the professor promised that he would write an explanatory note to the teacher whose class Megara was to attend next. Megara's neighbor chimed in on the man's remark. He asked Profern Voltaire why he would not conduct a similar test for a first-year girl. With a calm face, he told the young man that Neris had already proved that she had sufficient Verlaine language skills to stay within the visitation limits. Holding her anger in check, Megara asked Sir Voltaire, What happens if I fail this test? Questions like this gave the man a headache, so he answered very briefly that if Mehara could not pass this test, she would be sent to a class with the appropriate level of difficulty. She will not be able to rely on her neighbor's answers forever, because if he gives her the wrong answer, she will make a mistake too. Her thoughts were filled with potential anger at Maharada's brother, because she should have realized that she should not have relied on the knowledge of a fool like him. This made Neris smile with satisfaction, because she had achieved what she had been seeking all along justice. A whole crowd gathered around Megara to support her and motivate her to move on, rather than focus on the opinions of others. Looking in Neris Trid's direction, all the girls claimed that it was her fault that Megara did not please the professor, although Sir Voltaire himself was irritable and picky. Megara herself continued to grieve and claimed that she should have been better prepared and trained at the level of a ducal residence, so she had only herself to blame for her lack of preparation. Diane again decided to support her friend and stand up for her, arguing that she had previously told her that she had never studied at the Duke's mansion. Megara herself was so jealous of her because she had entered an advanced class without relying on herself and failed, so it made no sense to provoke such shyness, since it was Megara's fault. While listening to her friend's defense, she did not understand what Mahara's envy was about. She didn't think that the whole truth was hidden there. Because of this, 
she would not have wanted to jump in over her head so much. I used to not believe that Megara hated her only because Neris was strange by all the social standards of those around her. But if you think about her behavior, which was significantly different from the behavior of other children, a noble and brilliant daughter of the Marquis, as well as a beauty and owner of magical liquid purple eyes that fully proved her belonging to the descendants of Elandria. Megara was jealous of the knight's ordinary daughter, the sudden appearance of the owner of real eyes, and even with eyes that exceeded Megara's estimates. Megara herself could not bear the very fact of her existence, so here, too, her eyes were the source of all the misery in Neris's life. Following Neris's reaction, Diane continued to feel a little embarrassed that Neris had to hear such words addressed to her, because she thought her sad look was related to it. The thought also crossed her mind that she thought Diane's behavior was too reckless, because she didn't even want to pay attention to it. When you think about it, Neris was truly the smartest person Diane had ever met. She was a combination of kindness, elegance, and the ability to stand up for herself. She seemed really more mature than her peers, keeping rude people away from her, perhaps because Diane will behave too unculturally, based on the example of a similar situation that happened a moment ago. Nellis would not like it either, and her mood would deteriorate again. But in reality, the girl's thoughts were filled with something else entirely. I actually thought Neris was a very interesting person, so I wanted to get closer to her and become friends. But because they were taking different classes, the chances were too slim. Suddenly, a thought popped into her mind about how she and I could get closer. Suddenly, grabbing Neris's hands, Diane loudly invited her to a party she was going to host and would like Neris to join her. Diane's face was full of joy, as if she had already been looking forward to this party. Her words were full of enthusiasm as she said that they could spend this day together or invite their friends. Neris saw no reason for her friend's behavior, since she hadn't done anything special for her. But since she didn't see anything wrong with a simple invitation to a party, she didn't miss the opportunity to trust Diane and spend the day with her. Lifting her friend's grasped hand, Diane shouted joyfully, and remarking that this day would be especially joyful and would definitely not let Neris get bored. She had to have a magical party, no matter what. It was important for her and Neris's relationship to be stronger, and for Neris to be able to distract herself. She already had an idea of a close relationship with a close friend in her head, but so far they remained dreams. All of these thoughts led Neris to think that Diane was very strange, and Diane to think that she and Neris were real friends. His Highness greeted Duke Grunigal's daughter, Natasha, who brought him papers with the necessary information, which he asked her to obtain for him. These papers were answer sheets for the first-year students of the Nobel Academy. Albus reacted immediately, taking them in his hands and looking very interested. He praised Natasha for such high-quality work, which he was very pleased with, and took them in full in front of him for further review. Looking for the name of the one and only Neris tried among all the huge papers, he counted them at a frantic pace and finally saw the letters. One of the other people in the room was also curious as to what His Highness found so interesting in the ordinary forms of the first-year students. So he put away the rest of the papers, focusing his attention only on Neris Trids. Turning his head to the man who had called him over, his Highness eventually suggested that he also take a look at these forms and find something useful for himself. The representative of the interested person to His Highness's respective interest in the papers was Nelicio himself, who was later known as a foster father to Neris. Abelis said that Nelson would also like to see the results of this girl, whose education was paid for by his family. The crown prince of the imperial family of Visto noted that she had the highest score among all her peers. After handing the necessary papers to Nerison, Abelis also commented that Mahradi Enim himself was interested in this, asking questions about it. This Mahradi did not believe that she was capable of passing the test on her own with the highest score, being a noblewoman of the lowest class, so she claimed that her answers were copied or prepared in advance. Nelson's eyes rounded as he began to delve into the content of the text Abelis had handed him. A deadly question arose in his mind. Was this text really written by a freshman? Clutching the sheet in his hands, the white-haired man really wondered if the first-year student was really capable of such a thing. 
The answers were written down very competently and without unnecessary details, which made him think about the real age of this test. Turning half sideways and facing Nellison, His Highness also wondered the same thing. He was curious about the white-haired man's opinion, but it was clear from a glance at the letter. Many people suspected that Neris had indeed received this grade dishonestly and passed the test, but so far no one could confirm this. Eventually, realizing that it was just a routine test, Nelissian breathed a sigh of relief. It was a routine test, as Nelissian had assumed from the beginning that Abolus would not do something like this for some sideline relative. This is exactly what the crown prince wanted to hear, because he was simply asked to review all the documents because of a complaint. He just needed another confirmation of this. According to all the teachers, Neris was as literate as an adult and could easily keep up with the classes of a fairly high level. So His Highness wanted to know if Nelsian had been involved in her education, but he denied it. According to the investigation, Neris was also not an illegitimate child of the temple, so this led the crown prince to even more reflection. It is a fact that Neris was most likely born a genius, and if this was true, she could have played a good role near the imperial family. Nelissian also confirmed this with the same smile on his face as Abolus, fully understanding his train of thought and assumptions. Previously, Nelissian had only thought that Neris was an ordinary girl who happened to be born with the eyes of a Buddha. But now, knowing much more about her, he might have missed that she would be very useful if she really had such a gift, to remain as quiet as ever. Neris wished she could be alone there now and think about her plan of action, but unfortunately, she had to be alone there because of Cledwin. Through the same window on the roof, one could see the same Cledwin who guarded the library from unwanted people. The guy enjoyed his solitude and the opportunity to take a break, absorbing the sun's rays. Suddenly, his eyes opened, and he seemed to ask a question to the unknown. Had she finished her investigation? Behind him, the dark shadow of a man with an excessive smile appeared, indicating that his task had long been completed. Informing him of his tight schedule, Cledwin had no desire to listen to his long story, so he told him to hurry. He wanted to hear the results of the investigation that the shadow man had conducted. Hearing the words that the shadow man had found no clues, Cledwin's eyes opened wide and his calmness ceased to hover in the atmosphere above him. Informing him that Neris's mother was related to an Elandrian sideline and her father was a low-level knight. That was the information the Shadow Man was looking for. There were options that she was somehow connected to the Emperor or was a spy. Since Cledwin himself had the opportunity to meet her in person, he clearly knew that she was untrained, which made him feel as if he was at a disadvantage. It turned out that the Shadow Man could only say that this girl had accidentally stumbled upon the place where Cledwin secretly exchanged ciphers with his subordinates. When his father, the former Archduke, died, the Emperor, who had been eagerly setting his sights on the mainland, became terribly angry that his wishes were failing each time. Therefore, Cledwin had to keep in mind the possibility that the Emperor could lure such a girl to the Neris under his control and use her to spy on the boy. Recalling the face with which Neris came to the library, Cledwin could also assume that she was equally shocked to see him there. Although she looked like a twelve-year-old girl with a weak body and an inability to hold a sword in her hands, behind her eyes, Cledwin saw an adult who had seen many obstacles on her way. This only made him think that finally, in this boring academy, there was someone who could attract his attention and be interesting. The parties held at Nobel Academy generally fell into only two categories, namely those organized by the student council, which were free to attend, and those that were more like social events, organized by an individual student, which were restricted. Of course, most often the academy preferred time parties, to which children from families of approximately the same status, level, and income were invited. They also did not keep their comments to themselves, but exchanged rumors among themselves about which party remained or became first class, and which remained or became the worst. Speaking of the party Diane threw, we couldn't get too nitpicky or go into too much detail because it was an informal pajama party, so the goodies and top-notch sheets were quite enough for her guests. It was a really high-level party without any inappropriate gaps. 
All of the attendees praised Diane's party and thanked her for the invitation while she spent her time with Neris, as if she wasn't going to join the rest of the guests. She thanked everyone who came to her party for taking the time to attend, noting that if they needed anything, they could simply ask her maids. Even in the opinion of Neris herself, the party was really in line with all the requirements. So it was logical that everyone liked it and commented on the hostess. In fact, Neris didn't expect anything else from a child from County McKinnon, but a cheerful and bright girl like Diane. Turning to Neris, Diane told her friend with a smile on her face that many different delicacies had been prepared especially for them, which were not served at the academy, and Neris had to try them before leaving the party. With a strained smile on her face, Neris said that she had already eaten quite a bit, so she had to refuse, although she was very grateful to Diane for her concern. There was a tense atmosphere around her. She felt very uncomfortable because she could not understand the reason for such kindness to her, since she had not done anything special to her before. Their seemingly carefree atmosphere was interrupted by Angarad, who decided to come up to them to thank them for the invitation and compliment their hairstyles. Since Neris was used to hiding her true emotions, she thanked the girl and noted that she had an equally charming hairstyle. Diane was watching all this from behind the blonde girl. Suddenly, there were screams behind Angarad, after which one of the guys who was also present at this party accidentally spilled his drink on this charming hairstyle. He didn't watch out for it because one of the other people present pushed him. Angarad quickly reacted to this, feeling a cold liquid on her head, but unfortunately she was unable to react properly and jump away quickly enough to avoid the liquid. Right in the middle of the large, luxurious room, where loud laughter and merriment had been heard a moment before, there was an eerie atmosphere that put a lot of pressure on everyone as they began to feel the real atmosphere the party was taking on. This eerie silence was interrupted by a guy who started laughing out loud at Angarad's situation. He thought her appearance was very funny and wanted everyone else to share his mood. These loud shouts and laughter were also echoed by the rest of the students at the academy. One of the students remarked that due to the purple color of the spilled drink, Angarad Bula looked like a purple mouse. Neris also reacted to these cries, understanding what Angarad was feeling, and wanted to get rid of this atmosphere and similar words around her as soon as possible, because she knew perfectly well that the girl herself did not want this situation. Hearing these words about other students feeling uncomfortable and dirty just looking in her direction, she remembered hearing similar words in her past life. All these horrible words, even those not addressed to her, moved her at the time she heard them. Even after all this time, she could not forget the words of the others that she was a disgusting Neris Trid. Diane was quick to respond, as she didn't want to hear such words, not even from the person closest to her. It was her party, and she chose the rules she wanted to follow. Addressing the boy who spilled his drink, Diane said that he was the one who put the girl in this situation. He should have apologized instead of laughing at her. The hostess of the party also ordered one of the maids, named Patty, to help Angarad with getting rid of her old clothes so that she could put on new ones. Declaring loudly that the situation was resolved, Diane ordered the other children to play some more until the chocolate cake was brought from the kitchen. All this time she was silently absorbed in her thoughts, not even reacting to the situation around her. She was really deep in them, but she didn't want others to know about it. Suddenly, Diane called out to her because she was very worried about her friend and wanted to make sure that Neris was really okay. Diane apologized for the situation, which was eventually resolved, but to calm her down, she offered Neris a drink of milk with honey, which would make her feel better. Care and services are not meant to be repaid, as they are done voluntarily, but they should still be treated with great care and always kept at a distance. In the end, Diane could have been one of the girls who had abused Neris in her past life. The girl could not remember all her abusers, especially because there were so many of them. Continuing to try to calm Neris down, Diane argued that they had to have a little snack in order to continue their fun at this party. Relying either on her intuition or the fact that Neris had to have at least one person she could trust, she decided to trust her and accept her good nature. She agreed to this offer, asking her friend about the content and meaning of the game, and the latter began to tell her with a joyful smile. 
Diane's party went off without a hitch. After all, it was hardly her first party, so she knew all the rules. All good things must come to an end, and they had to go back to school the next day. Since this class was shared between sophomores and freshmen, Neris sat down next to Diane and began to prepare for her studies. As she reached into her briefcase with one hand, she felt something strange inside, so she jumped away, taking her hand with her. She realized that if someone noticed her unhappy expression, they would most likely be the culprit, but she continued to remain calm. Diane noticed her neighbor's strange behavior, so she decided to ask her what exactly had happened and why she looked so worried. As he was about to answer that everything was fine, one of the students who was also in the room suddenly called out. She also noticed that the blonde's expression had changed and decided to come over. Opening her eyes and turning her gaze toward the voice, which sounded rather long, Neris quickly realized who was trying to clarify the contents of her briefcase. The girl was approached by an Angerad who noticed her sudden reaction and came over at the same moment, standing almost close to the open briefcase. Diane also reacted to this, as she already sensed false intentions on the part of the Angerads. Quickly closing her briefcase, Neris responded with a similar question, wanting to know the purpose of the Angerad's concern. With excitement on her face, the girl began to tell me that she just wanted to make sure that everything was really okay, because Neris had quickly closed her briefcase after she had just opened it. All the while, Megara stood behind her, smilingly watching the Neris's disgruntled reaction, as if to make sure that her plan had worked. Neris herself noticed this as well, so she paid minimal attention to the Angerad's words and was more focused on the intense stare from her rival. Leaning on her briefcase with one hand, she replied that its contents consisted only of textbooks and writing utensils, but that this was definitely not of interest to the hangar. Angerad was really anxious and her face was more friendly than it had ever been before. She almost demanded that the girl open her briefcase and show her the contents. As if hearing some noise from inside the briefcase, she still wanted to look at the contents. But Neris did not allow it, as she saw no reason for the Baron's daughter to look into someone else's briefcase. Angerad didn't even hope to hear permission from the blonde, so she decided to act decisively and without asking for permission. Relying on the fact that they were friends, she quickly reached out with one of her hands toward her briefcase, trying to take it away. She was quickly stopped by Diane, who was already tired of watching this kind of thing and was already wishing that the Angerad would leave their company. Holding the briefcase away from the girl, Diane noticed that Neris had refused her and said everything she wanted, so there was no point in continuing. The first ones had already begun around them about Angerad trying to look into Trid's briefcase. The whispers grew rapidly, and the students' eyes were riveted on the three. Everyone wondered why the girl needed to look into someone else's briefcase. They began to skip over the fact that she was from a rural noble family and had not been taught manners. Suddenly, these whispers were interrupted by a boy who burst into the classroom and announced that today's dance lesson would be held in the small hall, so they had to gather their things and move quickly to the next classroom to avoid being late. Handing over her growing briefcase, Diane was already eager to leave the classroom and get to their next lesson as soon as possible. Throwing one last piercing glance in the girl's direction, Neris noticed that Angerad still looked not a bit different from her past life. In fact, Neris lied to the Angerad when she said that there was nothing in her briefcase, because she knew that her briefcase was now filled with large black spiders. She immediately realized that Megara had been involved, sending Angerad to ask Neris about the contents of her briefcase and to embarrass her main rival in front of the entire class. Most likely, they wanted to see Neris cower in fear of the common spiders in her briefcase. But based on the experiences she had in her past life, this does not surprise even her. Neris gave Angerad another chance, but she failed to live up to her expectations. So now taking her place by the Megara, Neris could not exclude her from her list of revenge. She was going to do something similar to what she had done with the spider before, taking it out of her briefcase. During a dance lesson held at the academy, students were preparing for the luxurious balls they were to attend in the future. This training also included the fact that they had to be able to change their partners during the dance, so the teacher tried to teach them this as well. During one of these partner changes, Neris ran into a student she already remembered from her past life. He praised the girl's dancing skills, 
inviting her to be his partner at the junior prom organized by the school council and taking place the following weekend. With a look no less malicious than her previous acquaintances from her past life, the blonde girl recalled all the events she had memorized with this student. He was a supporter of the Megara side, like the rest of the students at Nobel Academy. With a smile on his face, he called Neris Dirty Trid, based on the nickname she had received from her abusers. She recalled that once, as a punishment for something unknown, she received a glass of sour milk on her head, which she was not supposed to put down so that it would not spill and make the students' already smiling faces break into even bigger smiles. After finishing her wave of memories, Neris closed her eyes and said that she would not have time for it because she would be busy with a lot of homework. She could only look in on this ball with Diane, but that time would not last that long. Even without listening to all the words that came out of the boy's mouth, about how even on the day of the ball Neris would be busy studying, the girl herself was looking towards another couple twirling in the dance, namely towards the girl with white ribbons tied in the form of bows holding her luxurious red hair. Slowly one of the ribbons began to fall from her hair as the boy continued to try to maintain a dialogue, inviting Neris tried to the party at the Angarad Nain. She ran her hands through the hair that remained under the ribbon and almost fell to the dirty floor, dyeing it a duller and dirtier color. Neris watched all this in silence. It was as if she was waiting for it, and, seizing the moment, could catch it and give it to the owner, thus starting a dialogue. Gently pushing the guy away from her, she apologized for it and said that she had to go away for a moment, leaving him with a rather confused face alone. The ribbon was extremely beautiful, on one of its ends was the letter A, which was the first letter of its owner's name. Managing to grab the ribbon before it fell to the floor, Neris called out to this girl she knew from her past life, addressing her by the name of Aleto. Reacting to this, Neris realized that she had not made a mistake after all, and that the red-haired owner of the tape was indeed Alecto, although this was not an assumption, but an exact fact. Holding out the delicate ribbon that had been adorning her hair a moment before, Neris still clarified whether Alito was indeed its owner. Noticing that the ribbon had indeed managed to slip from her hair, Alito thanked the Neris, as the ribbon had cost her a lot of money when she bought it in the capital. Neris said that the red-haired girl should be more observant so that no one would substitute her, since lately all the students have been wearing approximately the same ribbons, which would make it difficult to find her own. With a joyful face, the girl said that everything would be fine because she had prepared for such cases. Alecto noticed that her ribbon was special because it had engraved initials on its ends, which she could easily recognize when she saw it. At first, not even noticing that the ribbon had already had a stain before it got into Alecto's hands, the girl said she had to fix it today and come back to the academy tomorrow with a clean ribbon that would look like a new one. This kindness was not unreasonable, because for all those present at this academy who had bad intentions toward the Neris in their past lives, she now had bad intentions toward them. She clearly remembered that around this time, cream-colored satin ribbons were in fashion among girls, so almost everyone had such accessories in their wardrobe. And it was not a big surprise at that time that one of the ill-mannered girls suggested that by replacing the usual ribbon, no one would even know about it. With a warm smile on her face, Angaret welcomed her two friends to her grand party with open arms. They thanked her for inviting them to the party, and she thanked them for taking the time to come. The hostess of the party said that Megara and Hellas would be absent because they were called to a meeting of high-ranking nobility, but the rest of the guests were present, so the girls could say hello to them. Neris noted that the theology building, which is now used as a banquet hall, was really old, so if you walk a little further and look in the corner, you can see a lot of spiders. Starting to worry that Diane might be thirsty, since they had been talking for quite some time, she decided to step away to get her a drink. Of course, the reason she left Diane's company was not for the drinks. She remembered that something big was going to happen at this banquet, and she was definitely not indifferent to it. Suddenly, the performance the girl had been waiting for began— Alecto shouted loudly at the hostess of the party, calling her a thief. With a slight smile on her face, and a look that knew the development of further events, Neris watched this high-profile performance. 
One of the maids grabbed Angarad by the hair and held her tightly, driving the party owner into hysterics as she claimed that Alito was doing crazy things when she was holding the Angarad ribbon. With a face full of anger, Alecto claimed that the hanger was not only a theft, but also a charming lie, looking her straight in the face. Holding the ribbon that had just been torn from Angarad's hair, Alecto kept shouting at her. The reason for this shouting was clear, for it was her own ribbon that she was holding. Looking sarcastically at the unfolding situation, Neris watched as someone in the crowd shouted that he had a similar ribbon. To this, Alecto only replied that she had her initials on it, which proved her ownership. Now realizing that the hanger had become an even bigger laughingstock in the eyes of the students who attended the party, I felt really satisfied that I had done almost nothing to punish her. As if leaving her to her own fate, the girl could not even help her, so it was like revenge from fate itself, as a payment for friendship and help to a bad person. It was her turn to try to find the right solutions and adapt to such a difficult life among aristocrats. It would be a lie if someone said that such decisions of fate were only due to the case of the briefcase, because the Angarad had many sins behind her besides that. Until the end of her days, Neris remembered the incident when the Angarad accidentally framed Neris, accusing her of stealing. Begging the Angarad to confirm her innocence in the situation, Neris bowed before her, tearfully begging her to defend and exonerate her in front of the rest of the audience. She just took the girl's briefcase from her, turning it over and shaking it so that all the items inside fell out. Among the large pile of educational materials, which included textbooks and brushes, a golden one fell out of the briefcase, the one they were looking for. Feeling the sadness of emotions that had accumulated inside her soul, she looked at this golden one, which she had even picked up, let alone stolen. Speaking to the girl, Angarad asked her not to pretend that they were close, because if she did, the rest of the students at the academy might think that she was also a thief. Coming closer and closer with each step, Angarad claimed that Neris Trid was an ordinary peasant girl who did not know her place in such a society. This was understandable, because it was unlikely that a daughter could learn anything from such a clueless mother, so it is understandable why she came up with the idea of touching other people's things. At first, the girl's tone was just something like scolding a friend for inattention and stupidity, but with each passing day, it became more and more irritated, as if her patience with Neris's behavior was running out. The bullying became more severe every day as Angarad learned the art from her close friend Megara. It was at that moment of this abuse in her past life that Neris became so sad and harbored a grudge that she did not even think about the real theft, which could have been the hanger itself, after all. If you think about this situation, she was the person who could have gotten close to her bag and put the gold in it. So now fate, in the form of punishment at the hands of the Neris, was pursuing the little Angarad for all the deeds she had done in the past, which meant the future. Three days before the hangar party, Neris went to the laundry room. Deciding to take advantage of the fact that the Angarads did not have a personal maid to do her laundry, she left her dirty clothes in the laundry room. Approaching one of the women working in the laundry, Neris asked for help finding her ribbon, which she said was the only valuable item she had. She claimed to have lost it here, so she asked for permission to look for it. The woman gave her the opportunity to examine all the tapes that had been lost within the academy, which were placed on a special storage shelf. Taking advantage of the fact that the woman had gone about her business, leaving Neris alone with the ribbons, she stole a ribbon from this shelf that belonged to the Angarad. Two days after that, the day before the Angarad party, she snuck into the laundry room in the dormitory, where the personal maid, Alecto, was performing her duties, and decided to change the tapes. Watching from the second floor how the maid, Alecto, was personally worried about losing her ribbon, Neris could not help but take this chance to replace them. The same ribbon that belonged to the hanger suddenly found itself on the floor next to the personal maid, Alecto, which Neris had lowered. All of this led Alecto to the conclusion that there was definitely someone other than the workers in this laundry who had clumsily left his marks, which confirmed Angerad's identity. When the personal maid came to Alecto's room, having fulfilled all her duties, she was even more angry and blamed the whole situation on the personal maid. In the morning of the day of the party that Angerad was throwing, 
the laundry room was quite noisy because of a missing ribbon that belonged to Miss Angerad. Neris was watching from afar, hoping to the last that her plan would be flawlessly executed. The search took a long time, so there was very little time to pay attention to details, which is why the first tape that came to the attention of one of the laundry workers and matched the factors of her favorite Angerad tape immediately solved the problem. They were so busy preparing for this party that they didn't even notice the difference this ribbon had in the form of initials. Angerad looked very frightened and confused. She started to come up with various excuses that could at least slightly improve the situation by claiming that she also had the initial A. Alecto continued to maintain her passionate tone and assert that it was her film, which she knew very well, so she could not confuse it with someone else's. Walking confidently toward her rival, Alecto offered the opportunity to verify her words by asking their maids to embroider the same letter and then see which one would look more like the symbol on the ribbon. Because the redhead was so sure she was right, she said she would not leave the hanger alone under any circumstances. She threatened to tell her father about this situation, who could have destroyed all the efforts of the Angered family in a moment, wiping them off the face of the earth. Through the crowd, her friend Diane made her way to Neris, who had been trying not to lose sight of her friend all this time. Finally reaching her friend, she stood very close to her and asked what exactly was going on. Neris lied and replied that she did not understand the meaning of the whole performance, nor the reason for it. One of the girls in front of them said that the anger at Nain had stolen Electo's ribbon, but this raised a different question in Diane's mind. Why would she want to do that, since she had an almost identical ribbon? No one knew the exact reason, but this girl assumed that the hanger could not cope with the stains that appeared as a result of so many ribbon seeds on her head. So, not wanting to buy a new one, she decided to steal it. In any case, Electo was able to prove her case because the first letter of her name was on her ribbon, and this letter was also on the ribbon worn by the Angerad. In the end, they couldn't understand why she was wearing someone else's ribbon, but they could only miss that the hanger hoped no one would notice her big prank and she would be in the clear. Such films were almost a regular occurrence for the Academy, so it was clear that a similar situation would eventually happen. By asking the question to Neris, the unidentified girl wanted to clarify whether she had actually met the Angerat as a child, as she had heard similar rumors from the Angerat herself. Averting her gaze to a more interesting situation, Neris pretended that she couldn't even remember a similar face from her childhood. Already on the floor, Angerat continued to scream mutely that she had not even thought about stealing the tape, as it had been given to her in the laundry room. The Electo herself claimed that she was different from the Ankarad peasant woman in that her personal maids were responsible for washing her clothes, and they took their job very seriously. Pulling Angerad's hair, Electo couldn't calm down until she was sure that it was the girl who had stolen her ribbon, as it was no longer usable. The crowd also took the side of the Electo because her excuses sounded more convincing and truthful than the words her opponent was trying to say. If you recall all the actions that the other students knew from the Angerads, they might have missed that she was really strange in comparison. All her attempts to leave a good impression in front of other children of high status seemed simply vile after these actions. All of this seemed very horrible and unworthy to the children, so they had no reason to stay and have fun at her party anymore. Angerad, who was sitting on the floor with her face hidden in the skirt of her dress covering it with her hands, continued to listen to all the insults that were directed at her. Nellis watched her in silence, comparing the situation now with her usual day from her past life. Of course, it was unfair, but all the actions that the Hangarat had taken against her had not been kind either. There were no strange children in the world. All of them are cheerful and active at the beginning of their lives, when they are just setting up their social skills. Unfortunately, not everyone has all the traits that would suit the society they came to, so this led to them becoming different, distancing themselves from other children. It is because of their peculiarities that they cease to be interesting to other children and go unnoticed. Or, if their boring life attracts the attention of one of the popular personalities, all the attention will turn into something terrible in an instant. According to society's standards, strange children are not born this way. 
they become like as a result of horrific actions by their peers and humiliation, even though they try to be polite and obedient. These children are mostly bullied because they want to please everyone and hope that their silence to such actions will result in the bullies leaving them alone. But in the end, all this is not enough for them, and they want even more, beginning to take their abuse to an absurd level. In this case, Angarad was able to feel everything that she was trying to do to the other children, so she hoped that she realized what a big mistake she had made in the past, and that she was paying for it now by becoming one of the strange children. This small incident became the reason for further discussions at tea ceremonies, which were often organized by girls within the academy. They condemned the outcome of this incident, which ended with the Angarad maid taking full responsibility for the misunderstanding and then being fired. One of them still didn't understand how the Angarad could behave like that, even considering that she was from the countryside. All these antics could have led to the fact that the reputation of other nobles could also be shaken. They focused their attention on the girls who lived in the settlements, and they saw Neris, who, in comparison, was simply amazing. Among all of them, or even the entire course, she was not the smartest and most intelligent girl they had ever seen. Her charming pink eyes could drive anyone crazy. She was born very smart, which only added to her charm. She was definitely special, and in the future she would be invited to many prestigious events because of this. With a strained smile, Neris thanked the girl for saying that, but added that she had quite a few flaws without it. This modesty was a bit of a decoration, but she shouldn't have underestimated herself so much. Although Neris's face looked friendly enough, the words she had just spoken to her interlocutor seemed ridiculous. Perhaps the daughters of noble families are used to comparing people like dogs. When she received the invitation to their party, where Neris was to show off her intelligence, she recalled that in her past life, none of them had even told the blonde about the invitation. In the past, after receiving an invitation to a party held in the hall of graduating classes, Neris had to return to her dormitory from a bad party, holding the invitation in her hands. Neris could not understand why no one came to this party, because Angarad had told her exactly the information that Neris had been keeping in her head. Perhaps she should have searched further, but she had no more energy or desire. So she decided to return to the dormitory when she suddenly heard loud laughter and light coming from the window of one of the rooms she passed on the way. Representatives of high-ranking families were laughing at Neris Trid's recent actions. They really couldn't believe that she had the sense to go there. In fact, they were very happy about this situation and wished they could have seen it with their own eyes. But in fact, they were not left with nothing because they had to observe the expression on her face when she received the invitation to the same party. Remaining outside the building with a confused face, Neris watched the culmination of this conversation. She could feel some shame that she had not really guessed the true intentions of this invitation. Angarad commented on the girl's short-sightedness by saying that she had long hated her, but she was not the only one who was really annoyed by Neris. She also really hoped that the girl would not think of coming to this party and ruining it by stealing it. Most likely, according to Angarad, Neris inherited her strangeness from her mother, because if you think about it, she was no less strange. All these memories suddenly overwhelmed the comments about the hangers, as the girls who were now having tea with Neris thought she was strange and creepy. They could not rule out the fact that she had stolen many things besides the Alec tape. It was true that Angarad had abused Neris, but there was only one thing that was unchanged from her past life. Angarad has always been terrified of insects, especially spiders. Most likely, when she was preparing a spider trap in her backpack, she was trembling with fear. Every time Neris heard the other girls say that the hangar was really terrible and they had always disliked it, she felt a little sad. Although she had achieved her desired goal, she was now filled with some uncertainty about what she had done, she wondered if this was really a fair price to pay for the Neris. A lot of water had flowed, and everything was in the past, but that did not mean that everything was erased and forgotten. The pain, anger, and sadness that Neris still held in her heart were wounds that would not heal even for the rest of her life. The bullying for which Angarad was punished has not yet occurred, so her guilt has not actually been proven, and she does not even understand what she is paying for. But still, Neris knew full well that this bullying would haunt her later, 
if she did not find a way to resolve it right now. Neris could not rule out such a scenario either, since the causes that had triggered all those events were already manifesting themselves now, repeating themselves in the past. Neris was looking for justification and peace of mind, punishing all her past abusers for something they hadn't even actually done. This is what made her think that she was turning into the same abusers she knew in the past. Visiting the tower again, which was located next to the Academy's library, she knew exactly who she would meet there, but decided to try her luck and hope that today she would be able to think about her plan within its confines. Wandering the corridors of the library, surrounded by shelves filled from top to bottom with various books, Neris sought an unknown peace of mind. Suddenly, she was called out by a very familiar voice that she had met last time. She had generally expected to see her friend here, but she hadn't expected it until the last minute. Addressing him behind one of the shelves that divided the large room into several parts, she asked him why he kept coming to this library. It was impossible to erase from memory a similar meeting that had taken place the previous time. It was firmly embedded in all corners of the two men's brains. Although Neris already knew about a similar owner of the library who combined his vacation with the security of such a place, she still visited the familiar shelves. As he had promised last time, he had learned her name, so he addressed her by it. The name itself sounded very unexpected and a little strange coming out of his mouth. A small argument ensued between them, during which the girl tried to convey to the boy that it was her place, even though he had no idea what he was thinking. Inspecting the room they were in now, the guy did notice that he had made some contribution to the development of this already quite dusty room. He attributed this development to a chair that was located almost in the middle of the room. The guy could allow this arrangement because the room was quite large and therefore empty. Neris wanted to know the reason for these interior changes and was told that Cledwin spent a lot of time inside the library, so he needed a place to think about his covert operations. He gave an example of one of these, naming a tape swap that Neris had recently done, which caused her face to suddenly become tense and negative toward the interlocutor. It turned out that Cledwin decided to find out not only her name, but this act already crossed the boundaries of the appropriate actions of knights, but it turned out that her actions were not similar to those of a lady. Neris did not want the boy to use such reasons to threaten her, because it simply did not make sense. The only thing that made sense was what he meant by it. He had already overlooked the fact that the girl would not want to talk much, so he already had a plan for that. Still on the other side of the shelves of books, he beckoned Neris to come closer to talk to her face to face, without trying to hide anything. The mystery and intrigue that was encoded in his words hooked the blonde girl, so her thoughts came to an end rather quickly, and she decided to go. Turning in the right direction, she walked past the shelves of books, stopping at the spot where the voice had come from. One of Cledwin's hands pushed the loosely stacked books to one side so that there was some space between them, through which they could see each other. When we stopped at the right place, we bumped into each other and Cledwin, who suddenly told us that he needed her. The blonde girl wanted to know his true purpose because, as she had said earlier, she was not in any way connected to Elandria. Touching the same books, Nera stated that if Clevin was interested in marriage, Elandria would be much more suitable for the role of his wife, as she was a direct descendant of Neris. He stopped the girl at these words and clarified that it was not an offer, especially in this way. He didn't want to let such a talent go to waste, so he wanted to direct it in the right direction. Even though he was a member of a strong family, everyone needs an assistant who will be responsible for the plan that he developed. This was his proposal. She didn't understand whether the boy was really speaking for her, because she was only 12 years old, so she could hardly be such a genius. Cledwin knew her age well, but he was more surprised that she was not afraid of the sharp sword that could pierce her throat at a moment's notice. In addition, she took first place in testing without preschool education, which was the first time since the academy opened, knew another language and all its nuances, and was able to manipulate public opinion. All these signs would be very useful not only for him, but also for the rest of the nobility interested in power. It would have been a great pity to leave such thinking in the gray masses, so this proposal had to be very beneficial for both sides. Neris had to think about it. He already knew enough about her to realize that such an offer could be both very profitable and dangerous for him. 
but in the end, he disappeared behind the shelves of books, saying that a ruler always needs talented people, which included Neris. If she had something that she desperately wanted to get from Cledwin, he was ready to listen to it and discuss all the nuances. All she had to do was find him. He also added that he would treat her according to the value she had set for her goal. These words became like a fog in her mind, but at the same time they seemed to awaken her consciousness. Standing at the luxurious door, which was illuminated by warm sunlight, Angarad was at a loss for words in the direction of her interlocutor. She refused her request because she realized that it could not go on like this. Even if it was a big request from the other, she could only refuse. Although Ankarad still felt nervous, as if she did not belong in this large room, she heard objections to her refusal. Her interlocutor turned out to be a Megara, who with a seemingly kind smile, asked the Angarad for a small favor, reinforcing that they were friends. The girl claimed that she was able to step over herself when she put large black spiders in her backpack while her fingers desperately slid down the fabric of her skirt. Already changing her tone to a shout, Angarad argued that this simply could not go on, and if she was caught next time, her entire reputation would be shaken forever without the possibility of fixing it. According to Megara, all this will only benefit the girl. It was as if she wanted Angarad to fall in the eyes of others. She got up from her chair and came closer to the guest, putting her hands on her shoulders. She promised that if everything went according to plan, she would do everything she could to change the negative image that the hanger would get. Megara claimed that the ribbon case was just a big mistake, and she believed that others had acted unkindly to the Angarads when they blindly accused her. As if hypnotizing her interlocutor, the megalomaniacal woman was forcing her conviction that everything would work out. Such a fee for such a small service would be very profitable. In an instant, the Angarad's gaze became maddened. These beliefs gave her complete confidence, but she continued to blindly believe the actual stranger. In fact, she was only interested in the price of this service, because she wanted to correct her image above all else. This time, she promised to make the Neris trid crawl on the floor, according to its origin. Attending one of the classes, all the students listened attentively to the teacher as he talked about the importance of traditional magic. According to him, in the era of the Three Knights, this magic was as natural as air. But in their days, it became a very valuable ability. He hoped that with the help of his lessons, someone in the class would discover at least a piece of this magical talent or gain basic theoretical knowledge that was indispensable for the nobility of the empire. The thoughts of Cledwin's proposal prevented me from listening carefully to all the teacher's words. It sounded really interesting and very secretive, which made me want to try it. As she contemplated the best plan for what to do next, she thought about how she could best act in this regard. The power that Cledwin of the mainland had was undeniable. When England became independent from the kingdom, even in the chaos of factional struggle, the maidenland was able to stand on its own. This was based on the idea that if one of the representatives of such a strong family stood by her side, she might be able to escape from the Hellenistic and imperial family and then start living a full life. The very reason she might have refused to do so was her suspicion of Cledwin's true trust, since she could not have trusted so blindly for the second person in a row. The chances that he would not betray the girl and sell her to this family when the precious eye of Helandria appeared were unknown, because this man was known even for killing his own servants, whom he had known since childhood. The girl was brought back to thinking about reality and the present time by an Angarad, which was located to the right of the Neris, and attracted her attention with its unusual behavior. Throughout the lesson, Angarad behaved very anxiously, looking around her as if afraid of something. Perhaps to others, this behavior would have seemed quite logical after all the events that had happened to her. But Neris did not know that something was wrong with this situation. A moment later, the seat behind the hangar became empty. She left it, and then left the office itself. At first, her anxious behavior, and then her leaving the office altogether, became a big question mark in the mind of Neris, who had been silently watching. Meanwhile, the other classroom Megara was in was not known for its quietness and ordinariness either, as she and her friend had already taken their seats and were preparing to study. Megara's neighbor, which prevented her from continuing her preparations for the lesson, 
when her eyes instantly rounded with surprise. Anxiously turning her friendly gaze toward the dark-haired woman, Megara asked what exactly had caused such a sudden scream. Changing the tone of her words to an actual scream, she claimed that her emerald bracelet, which her aunt had given her, had suddenly disappeared. She still kept up her tone and said that she remembered exactly that she had taken it off before class and put it in her briefcase. Such words brought a small smile to Megara's face, which was quite difficult to notice. Instantly changing her tone back to friendly and more sad about her friend's situation, Megara asked her to look through her briefcase again, but she continued to say that it was not there. Calling out to all the students sitting in front of her, Megara asked them to help her find the bracelet, as it was extremely important to her friend. Ignoring this request, the Electo continued to stare intently at one of the desks, carefully examining it. At one of these desks sat an angel, who lowered her head to the table with her hands on either side, as if to hide it from the light. A moment later, the teacher entered the classroom and noticed that some of the students were fidgeting around their seats, so she decided to ask the girls what exactly happened. Noticing that bitter tears began to appear on Rhiannon's face, the woman tried to calm her down, asking if she was really sure that she hadn't forgotten to wear it. In addition to Rhiannon, Megara also looked worried, confirming that she had seen the girl put it in her backpack before the start of class. Sighing loudly, the teacher realized that they would not be able to start this lesson without the missing item, so she decided to encourage everyone around them to search all the places around their desks. Electo noted that the search had been going on for quite some time, but they had not been able to find the bracelet. They looked in different corners, even in places where it was impossible to look, but it was all in vain. All of this indicated that another theft had taken place in their classroom, and the person who could have done this, based on all the recent events, was Angarad. It felt as if hundreds of eyes were looking at it alone. If you think about it logically, all of this really pointed to the hanger, since it was the hanger that was attached to the image of the theft. Coming closer, the Electo began to interrogate the girl, so that she would at least say a word in her defense or something similar. Lately, she had the strength to lie there without being able to move. Suddenly, the redhead was called out by a woman who ordered her to stop treating her friend like that and return to her seat. Neris and Diane, who had missed all the major events, suddenly entered the office, and now they could only enjoy the aftermath. Neris already had a rough idea in her head about the size and value of the emerald, so she understood why such a thing caused such a stir. After regaining consciousness and almost getting herself together, Rhiannon placed her palms on the desk and then stood up, offering one of the options for finding the bracelet. She said that in her grandfather's house, in such cases, they always check the pockets of those who aroused the greatest suspicion. People could not be suspected for no reason, but looking at the situation from a logical point of view, there was no other option. The teacher did not want to create an even bigger conflict by having to search all the students' belongings, but the situation just called for it. Objecting to the teacher's words, Megara decided to raise her hand and add some notes to this review. She thought there was no reason to search absolutely everyone. Since they were walking together, it was likely that the culprit was someone who left the classroom during practice. This list also included Angered 9, who left the class because she felt unwell, according to her, but after her earlier antics, everyone refused to believe her. Angarad had indeed been leaving many lessons lately using this excuse, but the children could not even imagine that it could be true. Suddenly, glancing back at the girls who had just returned to class, Megara said that Angarad was not the only one who left the classroom during practice, because it could have been Neris as well. Putting on a face of nonchalance and ordinary excitement, Megara apologized for pointing out the Neris so rudely. She by no means wanted to accuse someone who was completely uninvolved in the theft, but she also wanted to find out the real culprit. The looks of the other students in the class instantly ceased to be as friendly as they had been before Megara's words. Not wanting to get herself into any trouble, Neris nevertheless agreed with a friendly smile on her face. The teacher's face still looked very worried. After all, it's not every day that she goes into other people's briefcases and searches them. When asked to open her briefcase first, Neris let out a slight smile at the whole class, confident that they would not find anything there. For those who did not understand Neris at all, which is to say, for everyone, this situation was quite ordinary. 
she simply handed the teacher her briefcase, which at first glance did not even raise any doubts. Among all the contents of Nerissa's briefcase, the desired bracelet was not found, so she had to return to her seat while the Megara pondered how this could have happened. Her plan was flawless as always, but the Nerys still managed to beat her and play it to her advantage, causing her to think even more about the Nerys's awareness in a similar situation. Angarad was next on the list of suspects. The girl was shaking with fright, realizing that she could have been set up again and the bracelet planted on her. All the students' eyes were intently directed toward the potential thief, and everyone knew that if it wasn't her, the bracelet had magically disappeared. Trying to convince herself first and foremost, the girl went on and on and on about how she really didn't steal the bracelet, but her image was too weak to convince everyone. The woman, who sincerely believes in her innocence, hoped that the whole situation was a big mistake and that Rhiannon was probably just mistaken. The girl's hands trembled uncertainly as she handed the teacher her briefcase, hoping only that this bully, who was trying to make her look like a thief, would eventually calm down. Silently checking the contents of her student's briefcase, the woman noticed only school supplies, which she had noticed many times before on the desk of the Anchorad. Suddenly, her face took on a certain sadness and surprise as she saw something she hadn't expected or simply hoped not to believe. Holding the same emerald Ryanin bracelet in her hand, she did not want to believe that it was not a coincidence until the last moment. At first, not fully realizing the situation, Angarat herself wondered what exactly he was doing in her portfolio. After a moment, her face was no longer so calm and she had to really panic. She tried to refute all the thoughts that had arisen in the minds of everyone in the office, but her loud tone only confirmed her possible guilt. The undeniably piercing gazes of all the students present were directed toward Angarad. Looking at them, it was immediately clear that they had no good meaning, and Rhiannon's face was so angry that it was hard to believe that she would be able to restrain herself and not destroy the last image that remained in the hangar, even despite the presence of the teacher in the classroom. Despite her own beliefs that the hangar could not have committed such a crime, the woman had to trust only the dry facts and, to begin with, they had to return the jewelry to its owner. The woman asked the culprit, who was wearing the jewelry, to stay after school. These words terrified her even more. She had a feeling that the whole world was really against her. Neris continued to quietly observe the confused behavior of the Anchorads. She knew perfectly well that the girl was experiencing total injustice but she could not prevent it. In fact, she had no right to feel this way, because she was hurting herself by adapting to the megalomaniac's wishes. During the previous lesson, when she left the classroom claiming to be sick, she actually went to the classroom where they were to attend the next lesson. As she pulled the jewelry out of her briefcase, she was shaking with fright, thinking that she was being completely ridiculous right now. She thought that she could stop and do it now, but in the end, she remembered that this was no longer possible. The reason for these thoughts was that earlier in childhood, there were no obstacles or high walls between her and Neris. They were extremely close and had a really strong bond. She remembered everything to the last detail, every walk they took, every note of laughter, every bright smile Neris sent her way. All of it was stored in her memory. All of these thoughts turned into one horrible lump after Neris said on her first day at the academy that she didn't even remember her close childhood friend. Neris crushed all of Angarad's memories like a vile insect in her hands, with just one look of her bright eyes that peered into her very soul, as if mocking her. This was what completely redefined Neris in Angarad's mind. All those memories were just in the past— and now Neris was just a vile girl who was not even worth a single glance in her direction. The daughter of a low-ranking knight had no right to behave like that towards people who were superior to her. She couldn't be the best student, and everyone knew that a Megara was supposed to take her place. It was these factors that made it necessary for Neris to learn her true place in this society. It was the fairest payment for everything she had done for her family. As if to convince herself that she was doing the right thing, Angarat began to reach into her briefcase, where the bracelet was hidden. Angarat was not the only one who could see with her own eyes all the dirty deeds she was doing right now. On the other side of the door that led to this office was Neris herself, 
who was closely watching all the girl's actions through a small crack. It was a pity that the hanger had been standing with her back to the door all this time, and Neris could not see her face as she did her evil. A mind reader would have been nice, but that would have been beyond the pale. All her thoughts about the fairness of punishing her past offenders instantly dissipated. It all made no logical sense. Everyone was doing things that were beneficial only for themselves, not relying on the convenience of others. She completely rethought her life up and down compared to the past, but she completely forgot that all her abusers remained the same. Thanks to the anger ads, she saw this once again and was able to realize that all the children remained the same reckless children who did completely stupid things. Thanks to this incident, Neris's mind finally fell into place and she found justice in this world that did not really exist. When the Angerad quickly left the room she had been in earlier, Neris entered the office, her mind completely clear and separated from thoughts of others. Recalling her stupidity in her previous life, when she had no idea who could have put that gold in her briefcase, she simply could not allow the same to happen now. She saw with her own eyes how the Angerad snuck in and planted the emerald bracelet on her. It was like a challenge for the Neris to start acting so that the girl could pay fairly for her actions. Now in the present, and watching the hanger trying to prove his innocence and non-involvement, she kept her cool and calm. It shouldn't have worried about such a stupid thing, which it doesn't even think will be a problem in the future, because very soon the Angerad will experience a real hell, which Neris will lead it into. Later, when the situation with the bracelet was finally resolved, everyone almost forgot about it and rested without thinking about it. One of the events was that a guy named Albert approached Megara and handed her a rather modest bouquet of purple flowers. He commented on this nice gesture to the girl by saying that the flowers matched her eye color, and she in turn asked if they were really that beautiful. He said that it was strange that Megara should underestimate herself so much, because her eyes were many times more beautiful than ordinary flowers. Albert thought she was the most beautiful girl in the world. Against the background of their dialogue, another representative of the nobility, an Adalia, who could only dream of having a similar appearance to the Megara, sat. Megara was a representative of noble blood and had an impeccable appearance that could not be compared to any of the girls at the academy. It was this that made the poor girl think that Mr. Nelson would choose her among all the girls. This was the most logical thing to do, since aristocrats of high status usually chose women from families of the appropriate level as their wives. This was confirmed by Natasha, who was the daughter of a duke and was related to a prince, and among the noble families, the only daughter who fit the age category was Megara. Suddenly, the girl was called out of her thoughts by the same Megara, who asked if she was okay because she looked very agitated and deep in thought. Deciding to change the subject to something more relevant to their conversations, one of them remarked that it was very nice that they decided to hold this lesson outdoors. In the background of their dialogue, there was also Rhiannon, who sat silently in another group completely absorbed in her own thoughts. She was not at all pleased that Adelia was trying to get closer to Megara. They were lucky enough to be in the same group while she had to spend time with her most recent enemy. The entire time they spent together, Angarad did not say a word, looking very downcast. Rhiannon also did not like this kind of company and the welcoming atmosphere between them. Neris and Diane were more fortunate because they were in the same group and were close friends, so the time they spent together was quite enjoyable. Since it was allowed to talk between groups, Rhiannon spent her time next to these two, who were having a nice conversation with each other. She was annoyed by the fact that she came from a noble family, having among her ancestors a father who was the second son of a count's family, and Bertha, who had a deep history behind her, had to spend her time with such interlocutors. Rhiannon didn't even hide her dislike for her interlocutors, so it was clear from her face that she was not at all happy about it, but she couldn't help it either. She also looked in the other direction and noticed that Rhiannon was looking in the opposite direction from her friend Megara, who was talking to Idalia. He quickly realized what was the reason for Ryan's spoiled mood. Neris didn't want to sit idly by. The teacher, who was teaching the lesson outdoors, told the girls to try to practice the social etiquette they were studying in his class. Suddenly, the blonde girl was called out by a familiar Rhiannon voice, 
so she was quickly able to tune in to defend her side. Looking down at the girl, Rhiannon remembered that Neris had previously claimed to have been trained in etiquette. Deciding to play the fool, she pretended to be completely untrained in etiquette, so she wanted to see an example from a professional girl like Neris. Putting a smile of friendliness on her face, Neris gave the example that the dark-haired woman would be the first guest to be escorted to the place. As Rhiannon sat more comfortably in her chair, which was located on the fourth side of the table where all the girls were sitting, she couldn't stop thinking about how much her Neris was pissing her off. With such a humble background, she tried to jump above her head by acting arrogant and elegant, as if her origins were a very significant contribution to history. Rhiannon didn't understand why Neris paid attention to such trivial things as grades and foreign languages for nobles like her, so she chalked it up to the fact that she loved attention. As she began her reception, Neris thanked Rhiannon for taking the time to attend her party. She really hoped that they both ached to enjoy the time they would spend within its confines. Pointing to a chair on the other side of the Ryan, Neris offered to sit comfortably on it. With a wicked smile at the party hostess, Rhiannon said that, although she was the best student that everyone was praising, she didn't really think she was anything special. As I approached the new one, I noticed that the first guest was usually seated at the head of the table. The same head of the table was marked with the farthest place from the door. It was too embarrassing not to know such rules. Neris agreed with Rhiannon's remarks, but noted that these rules apply only indoors, and that different rules should apply outdoors. In nature, it is customary to seat the first guest in a place that offers a good view, so Neris suggested just that. Rhiannon remarked that Neris was once again trying to jump in over his head, and that such rules probably did not exist, because even she, who was the daughter of a count, did not know about their existence. Her friend came to Neris's defense, saying that when their family had a party in the garden, only important guests took a seat at the head of the table, which they chose to sit in overlooking the best flowers. Such words make me feel angry and claim that such rules were specially invented by Diane's family because they were a family without history. These words really hurt Rhiannon and Diane, who was already in a bad mood. She was about to reply to her, but was stopped by Neris. The blonde girl suggested asking the teacher about this rule because he probably knew better and he could just judge them. This proposal caused a look of surprise on Rhiannon's face and made her feel some tension which gradually began to build up on her. A man named Lord Sheridan took a moment to approach the young ladies. He was surprised that the Neris needed his help, but he was also pleasantly surprised by their interest in learning his subject. Changing the angle and shifting the responsibility to Rhiannon, Neris said that it was she who wanted to clarify something with her husband, but she quickly began to recant her own words, as Neris had misunderstood her. The man left their company a moment later, commenting that if they needed his help, they could call him at any time. Even after he left, Rhiannon's face took on a more angry emotion. The dark-haired girl commented that Neris's behavior was very childish. She scolded her in a very harsh tone of voice, and she called the teacher. Suddenly, her friend stood up for her, confirming the truth of her words. When Rhiannon heard Diane's voice, she looked back without changing her expression. The green-eyed girl called her interlocutor a child, because she did not want to admit her mistake and ask her teacher for help. In Rhiannon's opinion, such remarks were completely pathetic. It was as if they were mocking her, claiming that she had made a mistake, although in fact she realized that the meaning of their words was only to humiliate her. Now it was clear why Megara hated these two so much. Neris was a strange and insolent quiet girl who tried to attract as much attention as possible, and Diane, in turn, was a spoiled girl who relied only on money. Such a picture made the imperial irritated Rhiannon even more eager to leave their company. Unexpectedly putting on a joyful smile, Neris was able to greet the last guest of her party according to etiquette. Angarad, on the other hand, was not so pleased with the attention to her person, because after all the abuse she had suffered recently, she preferred to be quiet and invisible in companies. Neris was pleased that Angarad had finally found time to attend her party and told her that she had saved the last seat of the entire table for her, so she had to take it. With every step that the last guest of her party took away from her, the atmosphere around the hangars took on deeper and darker shades. Suddenly she asked if Neris hadn't planned and done everything. She had almost taken her seat, 
but this question had been bothering her a lot lately. Pretending that the blonde girl had no idea what she was talking about, she didn't even look back at the hangers. Raising her gloomy gaze, she asked if Neris was the person who had stolen Rhiannon's bracelet and put it in her backpack. These words could have been very dangerous, but the girl's image was already tarnished. Watching this picture, surprise and anger slowly reappeared on the dark-haired girl's face. She wanted to hear a clear answer from the Neris, although she was already convinced that the question from the Angerads was true. Continuing to mumble excuses under her breath, Angaranth claimed that her father was able to buy her clothes and school supplies, but Neris could not possibly have that kind of money, since the blonde girl wore the same clothes all the time and had no servants. All these factors pointed to her being the one who was able to steal the item. As she sat up, she realized that she was at a loss for words. The angry look in the direction of the hangers made her skin tingle and shiver. She did not understand why the anchorad was performed in the presence of the victim. Everything went beyond the rules of any etiquette and concepts of morality. She should have spoken up before she was accused, but because the bracelet was found in her briefcase, she couldn't prove anything, so her confused and innocent look was misplaced. If she did find even a drop of courage, she should have at least stood up for herself and not shut her mouth, continuing to play the victim as she was doing right now. Rhiannon ordered him to move away from such disgusting behavior, as if she were really so innocent and unaware of anything, continuing her pretense. The same shameless pretense that Rhiannon spoke of was inherent in her. Based on all the experiences she had had in her past, she had dirt on virtually all of her students. Opening her school closet, which was filled from top to bottom with all sorts of dirt that she managed to throw in through the holes, Neris noticed a beautiful envelope that was hidden under her textbook. It stood out significantly from the cabinet's contents because it was so white that it was almost blind with its glare, and the seal it held was quite fresh. Already expecting to see the text in front of her, a complete image, something in the girl's soul told her to open the envelope, which she did quickly enough. Suddenly, her eyes snapped open, and she could read in the text content that someone with the possible pseudonym Nona had left her a small letter with a message. Examining the careful handwriting, Neris noticed a message among it that a certain Nona wanted to become her friend. Looking around, the girl tried to find this Nona who might have the courage to come and ask to be friends with Neris in person. At least, that was what the girl hoped for. She wondered who exactly it was. She missed that it could have been a senior student who hadn't heard all the dirty rumors about her yet. In this entire academy, where there was only hatred around Neris, there was a person who was the first to offer her to become friends. And of course, this made Neris very enthusiastic and eager to meet. Without waiting a moment, Neris started writing a letter to her possible future friend in response. Until that moment, she could not even imagine that there were still students in the building who did not care about the rumors. This Nona never wanted to reveal her true identity, but she grew up not minding it, since it didn't matter who her only valuable friend was. Over time, which passed quickly as they exchanged letters, Neris revealed many secrets about herself, and her heart began to open to Nona. In the end, this correspondence did not last as long as the girl might have wished. Her excessive frankness and desire to believe that there were still normal people within this academy played a very cruel joke on her. As if a flower that had been blooming for a long time, it had suffered its own internal death and the beginning of distrust of every living thing. In the backyard of the Nobel Academy, there was also her secret hideaway, where she came to take a break after classes and do her favorite thing, which distracted her from unnecessary thoughts. This place was the real air for Neris. It was only in this natural area that she could feel at ease, ignoring the walls of the library. Here she could freely plant plants, giving them all her love. Putting the last of her energy into it, which she had after all the insults she had heard during the day, ended up being just as bad as her trust in everyone. When she returned to her flower bed, she was met with a not-so-nice surprise in the form of spoiled flowers. 